Hey there, everybody. Okay, so in this video lecture, you know, we try to keep these video lectures short, but I apologize, this is going to be a little longer. Uh, in this <laughs> in this one, we're going to work through the full version of this uh, Excel spreadsheet that I've made for the class. And I'm going to move pretty quickly through this. Now, you, you, of course, have this with the class, right? So you can download this and sort of play around with it yourself. And for sure, you're going to have to do that to see how all these pieces fit together. Okay, so I'm just going to move from left to right and top to bottom. Okay, so starting with the household sector here, this should look fair, fairly familiar. This was all in the abbreviated model that we went through several chapters ago. Uh, the given household consumption function can be found here, right? This is just a note section to show us kind of what we're doing, right? And how the model's working, uh, as well as have some given values here. Uh, again, these are all sort of behavioral variables that if we were sort of doing this in the real world, right, we'd have to estimate. Uh, perhaps using the reg regression techniques that we also saw in, our, in an earlier video. Okay, um, so if we click on these cells, right, we can see that this one here, household income, is given from cell M4, which is over here, right? So this over here on the far right hand side is our sort of given box, and then everything else is sort of our generation, except for this here with your notes. So. In this model, right, income, we we're assuming that initial income is 1,000, and then, you know, given our consumption function relationship, which we see programmed in here, uh, spending, consumption spending is 750, uh, realized savings is 250. Moving over to the government sector, we currently have the government occupying a neutral position, that is to say its budget deficit is zero, its spending is zero, and its taxes are zero. If we wish, we can change that over here, and I'll show you that in just, just a minute or two. Uh, our business position, right, so this is our needed investment, needed investment court for being the amount of business necessary that's going to be necessary to stabilize households' preferred savings, right? Uh, and then realize investment is how much investment act business actually uh, did, right? And since these two are equal, right, as a practical matter, what ends up happening is that income is equal to expenditures and we have a stable macroeconomic system. Uh, but if let's say interest rates go up, let's just do that quickly here and enter in one rather than zero. Okay, we can see that realized investment is going to fall below what is needed to maintain households' desired real savings. And we are going to, household savings is going to be less than what they actually would like to save. And we're also going to enter into an unemployment contractionary period. Okay, let's put that back to zero. <clears throat> uh, we can see it stabilizes again. <laughs> okay, so in our given box here, we have initial incomes, right? So these are things that we're programming into. We have taxes, right? We can change that if we change up to, let's say, 100 or something like that. Uh, you can see then that the government position changes. Uh, we now have a budget surplus or a negative budget deficit, and uh, this puts us into a contractionary uh, situation because household spending ends up being insufficient to stabilize uh, the business position. Okay. Put that back to zero. Uh, we can see core household spending is our given. It's our value of C0 in our model, right? So C0 right here, if we don't remember what that is. Desired spending, right, is, <clears throat> is this value here. And that's just given, again, by, you know, what we, what we are programming in here. Uh, desired savings, also um, government spending. Core business investment, this is our value of I0 here. Interest rate, which is small i here. Uh, and we are programming into it the value of zero right now. Um, required reserves, uh, this introduces a financial system. This was not in the earlier version of Excel. We're assuming that it's 10%, right? But we could change that as a matter of monetary policy, right? And it's gonna change things down here in the financial sector. And then also the existing amount of federal debt, uh, which we're programming in is just saying it's 10,000. All right, I'm going to move myself up here so we can kind of pop down here. On the lower half of this, we have the financial sector. So up here was the real sector, right? And up here is the, down here, excuse me, is the financial sector. I've just entered in a handful of commercial banks, a dealer network bank. So this is the, the bank that would be, uh, the Fed would be conducting monetary policy with, right? So we talk about open market operations and the buying, selling of treasuries. Fed generally does that with, uh, not generally, it does that with its dealer network, right? And so we've just entered in a dealer network style bank here and then the Fed itself, right? Okay, so now you'll notice that each of these banks, right, have reserve requirements based upon household deposits, right? So this reserve requirement is just 
10% of total household deposits. Why? Because of this. If I change this, the reserve requirements is going to change down here, and this bank's going to have to hold more reserves. Um, now they have 125 household deposits each. I've just split it equally, right? Because that's total household savings is 250, right? And that's also programmed in. So if households save more, right, these are going to change as well. Uh, and what is this here? This is just business revenues, right? It's 750 in total from household spending, as well as any government spending that occurs, which is zero right now. But if government spending goes up, these business deposits are going to go up. Uh, excess reserves then is the difference between what banks are holding in uh, reserve and what they need to hold in reserve. So this is money that could be lent out in each of these cases. Uh, these are loans outstanding. Okay, these of course sum to what? They sum to business investment and if business investment changes, these are gonna change as well. Uh, this is treasury debt that these banks are holding, 225 each, okay? Uh, and, and that uh, has to do with their, you know, of course their, their general position. Uh, if if, if uh, the Fed wishes to conduct open market operations, right, they could buy up that debt or they could sell more of the treasury debt that they're holding to these commercial banks. Finally, then 500 and 500 is their, their summing of their assets and liabilities. Okay, moving over to the deal net, dealer network bank, it's essentially the same idea, right? But we also have Fed funds loans right now. Um, so these would be loans that, that they're making to the commercial banking sector uh, for, for uh, reserves. Uh, right now, there's, there's no need for them to do that. But if, for example, there was a situation where commercial bank A or commercial bank B were somehow short of reserves, they could borrow those reserves from um, the, uh, the, the dealer network bank, right? Okay, reserve accounts, excess reserves, all the stuff here, treasury debt, okay, and then finally the last position we notice here is equity. Equity is the difference between the bank's uh, total assets and uh, total liabilities in effect. Okay, um, and we'll come back to that again. Essentially, that's what that's what the bank is is worth, right? A um, uh, little bit of a complicated idea, but you know, when you actually look at the formula here at the Fed for what equity is, I think it becomes clearer. And that's the key thing in this is to you know, when you're looking at this model, one you know, be watching this video, me explaining it right, but it's equally important, or perhaps more important for you to kind of look at what's going on in these cells, right? So all these cells sort of work with each other. Uh, and you should look at them and learn how these pieces interact, you know, and even maybe break them, right? Or just, you know, play around with them and see what happens. It's okay if you break it because you can just download this file again, right? And break it again, right? So I encourage you to dig into it, play around with it, learn how it works. Uh, you know, that's how you're going to figure out how all these pieces fit together. All right. Um, so in this case, I have the Fed holding all these treasury, virtually all this treasury debt, right? So this is 10,000 minus this and this, and we get this. Um, now, of course, it, it doesn't have to be that way, right? In fact, households could be holding this treasury debt, right? It could sort of be all over the place. And of course, we remember that the tr Fed can't buy this treasury debt directly from the treasury. So this would have been treasury debt that the Fed has purchased up from you know, wherever, right? It could be these commercial banks, could be households, could be businesses, could be a com it almost certainly is a combination of all of them. Okay, reserve deposits. This is just the sum of whatever the commercial banking system is depositing at the Fed. Okay, currency and circulation. This is the monetary base. So currency and circulation, there's a number of ways in which we can define it. Uh, you know, so this is monetary base, which is the tightest way to define it, right? We could have made it M1, we could have made it M2, M3, right? But those would have made this a lot more complicated. And so a consequence, I just have it grabbing the monetary base, right? So the monetary base, as we'll recall, is sort of just the hard physical cash in the system, which we also have calculated right down here. And you can see, right, so this is a formula. Uh, you can see what it's adding up to grab that, and you'll, you'll know what that is then. Okay. Um, Let's see, okay, at the very bottom here, we have total credit creation, right? So this is the amount of credit that banks are creating. This is total purchasing power in the economy right now. This is the existing monetary base. This is the total credit to base or this total leveraging in the financial system, just over four to one, quite extremely modest, right? Um, and then here we have some assumptions that we've made about the financial sector in this model. Um, and you can see what those are, right? So for example, like we're assuming that the banks will never hold more than 100 in excess reserves, right? So the way, way the little model works is that if they have excess reserves more than 100, right, then they start to try to grab up treasury debt. All right, this has gone on quite long enough for one of these video lessons. So again, 
uh, check it out and uh, you can kind of see how they all all pieces kind of fit together. Thanks very much. We'll see you again next.